uh, what the title says is we have storage management tools and possibilities and VMware management tools and possibilities. How do we bring those two things together? And I mean, it's some pretty heady stuff, right? So improve performance of the storage. Wow, geez, tell me how that's going to happen again. Improve performance at the server. Gee, that sounds great, you know, ease of use. Um, but it's true. If you take a look at some of the uh, technologies that are available, and one of the ways to deliver those technologies, in this case, the focus is going to be the EMC VMAX, but it should be noted that the uh, unified platform provides for the same things, fast adherence to the vStorage API and a form of storage pool management. So this is going to use VMAX as a delivery mechanism, uh, but the uh, rest of the arrays in the EMC storage family do similar things. So are folks familiar with uh, the concepts of fast, let me ask? and how all that works. Because we'll have a pretty good understanding of how, you know, what are you doing? You're shifting blocks around and it's sublon. Um, also VAAI, have people seen those VAAI presentations? And so if folks pretty much know that, then maybe we can, uh, um, maybe that can just serve as an overview. Uh, and lastly, we, we have a concept called storage pool management, which is in context storage provisioning from the vSphere client. So the array is ready for you to come and do some provisioning. And right from within the client, you can go ahead and provision some storage. Um, can I ask folks, are, are we VMware administrators or storage administrators or VMware administrators? And presumably storage bent in the other direction? All right. Um, well, this is some storage specific stuff. So how do you improve performance at the storage level. Well, with FAST, what we do is we monitor the I.O. to particular regions of disk. We monitor, we monitor the I.O. To the, to the entire disk, but we monitor I.O. to the particular regions of disk known as sub-LUN. So a key concept of this FAST talk is that you can do it at the sub-LUN level. So when I start thinking about sub-LUN operations, what does that say? That says to me a VMDK file that's on a data store that's on a LUN somewhere. So we're starting to get some of the advantages of file processing at, in, in block devices using so-called sub-LUN operations. And there'll be more on that later. So OK, so you can move data at the sub-LUN level. Well, it has to be done according to policies. And so policies will explore some samples. It says, OK. What should I, how much of a given resource should I give a particular policy, good, better, best, or what have you? Also, we're finding, surprisingly enough, that when you are deploying flash drives in conjunction with FAST, it drives the cost down. Because with as little as 5% of flash drives, and you see the mixes here, and 40%, so in going from fiber channel, go to 40% SATA with 5% flash. With this auto mixing or this, this auto tiering technology, it's cheaper. The, the disk itself is cheaper. Also, we, we, the, the array itself, by the deployment of virtual provisioning, enjoys performance gains by wide striping all the data in a thin pool. You know, the, the, the TDEV is a logical entity, it's a logical LUN, but then there's some real data disks underneath it. But once those disks are bound in a pool, you may as well stripe as wide as you can across those disks. Uh, virtual provisioning in the array. Are folks familiar with, uh, with how this works, pretty much? Uh, the notion that we take some physical devices, data devices, and we put them together. We reserve them into something called a thin pool, as illustrated in the lower right-hand picture there. From that thin pool, then, we cut up logical, logical devices, and we make bets that not everybody is going to use every bit of storage that they ask for. Hence, it's going to be thin allocation. We're only going to give you what you're using. And we get into the need to monitor that pool. Is that pool filling up, et cetera? But it's really a way to um, improve performance and save on money, reduce the overall number of disk drives in the storage array. 
An individual pool contains data devices of only a particular type, flash drives or fiber channel or SATA, because you know, obviously you're going to be mixing across all the devices, and you wouldn't want that. But we're, we're going to take advantage of that with technologies like FAST. We're going to take advantage of the different types of pools. So how does this work? A LUN is broken up into sub-LUNs, which are also called chunks. And you move individual chunks of the data to different blue, red tiers. It's literally the ability to peel this apart. It's kind of, uh, I don't want to say it's revolutionary, but you know, in the, at the block level of storage, to be able to do this now, wow, we're really getting to some, uh, some interesting possibilities here, especially if you have the block list. Now, one thing that VMware doesn't publish is the list of blocks associated with a particular VMDK file and its associated VMX file, if appropriate. Um, they utilize it with VAAI as, as we talk about it, but, and I'm not saying that as a knock on them because, you know, there's, there's a lot going on. VMFS isn't NTFS, right? Because with NTFS, you can look it up. You can take the file system extents and you can translate them to block. And so there may be darn good technical reasons why. But once you match that up with the block list, like we'll see in VAAI, you can really do some cool stuff about moving around these VMs. And, and like we're seeing with FAST, it, uh, it's sub-LUN. So, so FAST's ability to perform sub-LUN level operations relies upon um, technology which is also leveraged in the array API to do the extent-based copy. We now know we can do operations on pieces of disk. It's, it's totally cool stuff and is a, is a hooray for block. Um, I mean, I think NAS is terrific and you're going to do both. Well, let me ask, are folks pretty much us, utilizing both NAS and block? Or, uh, so how about just block? Uh, NAS and block? And NAS remaining? OK. So this is primarily for block level. But we're also going to be seeing in the NFS devices some similar support for VAAI and some, because NAS, there's, there's back end disk behind there somewhere. There's spinning disk behind there somewhere. And there's going to be flash behind there somewhere. So everybody's going to get into, I, I believe, the sublun business. Anyway, and, and as you may have heard yesterday from some of the EMC sessions, also the tiering business. Um, has anybody seen any of the Chad Sackett presentations or did you see any of that stuff, storage heavyweight stuff? Well, he's great. If you get a chance, yeah, Brian. Uh, if you get a chance, uh, uh, yeah, check this guy out. He's certainly, uh, he's a visionary, and uh, he uh, puts on an interesting presentation as well. So the good, then this isn't, this isn't pure um, repetition for you. So how do we implement it? And this will be the last of the, of the slides on FAST. There's a lot more to it. Uh, it's worth noting that FAST VP is coming, as, we, as was stated yesterday. It's coming in Q4. Uh, we have fast for thick now, but fast for thin is coming. Um, how's it going to work? Well, you start with the thin pools, just like we have now. And those thin pools actually represent something called a tier of storage. A tier of storage is the type of disk, like flash, and RAID 5, 3 plus 1. So you can get pretty granular if you have fiber channel, you know, uh, RAID 1, uh, RAID 5, whatever, you know, the, the, the two types of, of things allow you to, to come up with a lot of different tiers. From those tiers, we create, we, we apply what's in the tiers to fast policies. So we have a fast policy here called performant, and it has some mix of access to flash and fiber channel and SATA. And, and the way it works is anybody who comes along in a fast enabled array, and not anybody who comes along, but some, uh, uh, somebody who's operating from a storage group and needs some storage in a fast enabled array, and that storage group is associated to a particular policy like performant, <clears throat> they put the data and they put things in the hands of the array. They say, okay, you've given me a storage device. I, you know, I, I know it's some mix of technologies back there, but it kind of, in some ways, it simplifies it. It takes away from what these RAD, uh, uh, RAID categories are and People don't necessarily want to know about, you know, uh, RPMs of disk anymore. So we're kind of, this is in policy. Everybody's talking policy these days. So this is setting policies on these um, fast 
operations. Test, for instance, you might have a different mix with no flash, and you can mix and match. And as you can see here, you assign it to the storage group, so applications are coming in from the right, and they're asking for this service. So any questions on, oh, and let me just add one, one thing, um, that uh, when you start talking about fast, there are a couple of things you have to keep in mind. What's the polling rate? So do I sit there all day checking in on my disks? You know, how do I do that very aggressively? Do I do it per second? You know, how much overhead? Although fast takes very little overhead. You know, what should I be doing? Uh, the second time is when should I, second thing is when should I be doing the polling? So it it's not, might not necessarily give a good sample if you have a VM that's very busy during working hours, but it's dark at night, if you say, well, check this thing out over 24 hours, oh, you know, it's going to work on the average I.O., so you should set your sample period during the day, during the busiest or peak times, if possible. And then the third parameter is, okay, and when is it all right for me to move these blocks around? Do I'm going to do that at night? That's another uh, 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 parameter that you can set. And so if you follow that timeline, you can see how this is complementary. <clears throat> Excuse me, did anybody see any of these storage I.O. controls stuff? Rob? <laughs> that happens in a much more rapid fashion. So this is, I'm going to analyze this stuff during the time you tell me I'm going to be so, a 1 to 10 scale on how aggressive a sampling I'm going to take, and then I'm going to move it over later on. That's kind of how it works. So good complement there to um, SIOC. Okay, any questions on FAST? Shall we move along to VAAI? And then on to my favorite topic, management. Okay. So one thing that I haven't heard from the VAAI presentations is that this is designed to make the servers faster. It's, it's race gas for the exact same engine. You get it, and you, you know it's the first one I said, well, it's no user intervention, right? Well, same, this, this is even less user intervention. With FAST, you have to set up the policies, et cetera. You know, the storage admin has to get involved. But with implementation of this VAAI stuff, you know, you offload the operations. In the case of uh, uh, the VAAI API, that formerly were taking up uh, cycles from the storage I.O. subsystem and, and overall in, in, in the kernel, uh, you know, up to memory, uh, everything, CPU. So we're going to take a look today at VAAI and just make, uh, be known, uh, let it be known that for the storage vendors or anybody, uh, partners, you can write to these other APIs as well. Uh, you can leverage the API for Site Recovery Manager. You can write to and read from these other APIs as well. For site, that's how the SRM stuff is built. Data protection a la Avamar in the case of EMC and different data protection products. And multipathing a la PowerPath. Uh, for EMC, but the other multipath thing. Uh, that API is there for multipathing. I think Chad was saying yesterday, Equalogic is the only other vendor that has uh, written a multipathing piece for ESX. So PowerPath out there, certainly. Uh, anybody running, any PowerPath users out there? In your, uh, uh, it's, uh, definitely the industry uh, standard, uh, a variety of flavors, et cetera. So, but we're going to talk about VAAI. And so, there it is. It offloads operations. And you, you hear it in context of upload, offloading operations to the array. But I really want to see, once this thing gets widely deployed, I want to see somebody and not, you know, a vendor. Uh, did anybody check out the hands-on lab by any chance and see any of this VAAI stuff in action and see things go 10 times faster or whatever? Um, I really want to see, once this hits the streets and, and different partners are able to take a look at this and say, hey, wow, you know, this is, was my real results. <clears throat> I did 10 things instead of two things in this amount of time. And, and there, there's the proof. I did it in a non-VAI environment and then with the same kernel, because that's the trick. You'd have to, uh, you know, do with the same kernel, because there's been improvements in the I.O. subsystem of VXX to begin with onto a non-VAI array, upgrade the array, and then do the comparison. So... Uh, some rah-rah there for VAAI, but your storage vendor, whoever that happens to be, is likely going to deploy this stuff. And it happens automatically, and it happens automatically in a couple of use cases. It, it, it's, for one thing, with vSphere, it's, it's already on. Oh, and okay, so uh, the standard t -ton commands, it's SCSI commands that are doing this on your behalf. The kernel is sending SCSI commands to the array to saying, do something for me and let me know when you're done. 
So what are some of the use cases that we leverage the array technology to do? Um, the first here is something called hardware-assisted locking. What it does is it replaces um, SCSI reservations on the disk at the LUN level. This is another instance where, you know, fiber channel storage is trying to be more granular in, in management. What was happening was when you boot 500 VMs, you had to take out 500 individual locks on the disk while you updated the VMX file to say this thing is running or there's a, bunch, a whole bunch of other samples that, um, you know, snapshotting. Um, when uh, a lot of VMs are being created, a lot of metadata updates are taking place, they formally would lock the whole disk. So now with something called atomic test and set, what VMware does is they find a region of disk that they would like to modify. And they take a 512-byte snapshot of that region. Okay? Then they go off and make some proposed changes, you know, within a few clock ticks now. You know, you flip a few bits in a copy of that 512-byte region. Then in one atomic operation, you peek back at the original data. If it's the same as the snapshot that you took, you're good to go. You only lock that portion of the disk and you, boom, overlay your changes. Same effect as locking a device so that nobody else can come in and do it, but the key is it's an atomic operation. So uh, SCSI is taking care of this for you. So this one's a little bit harder, I think, to quantify. I want to see a 1,000 desktops boot up between, you know, 8 and 9 and do some performance measurements and then do the same 1,000 desktops on another type of array. So this one is a little bit, okay, just general goodness. Intuitively, though, you can see how that would, that would improve matters. Next is for zeroing out devices. Uh, in the case of fault-tolerant disks or, or eager zero-thick format, we're going to write zeros to the whole 10 gig, 20 gig right up front, uh, for instance. Although this, anytime we do any kind of zeroing of even regions of disk, having the hardware do it over the kernel is better. Uh, what this does is it, it utilizes something called the write-same command. Again, the SCSI command called write-same. And it's a clever use of write-same where the kernel says, okay, I'm going to give you a, a, a bunch of data. Write the same, use this and write the same thing over and over and over again. And that bunch of data, I think it's maybe a uh, one megabyte piece. Does anybody know for the right same pieces? So a relatively granular piece, or 768. I think it is 768. It says, OK, just keep writing all these zeros until you get to 10 gig in a particular region, and then pass me back those addresses. And, and, and the array just goes ahead and takes care of that, rather than some you know, I.O. operation taking place within that subsystem of the, the operating system. So much more efficient operations here. Uh, certainly, uh, and in this case, you can test it with a, st you can test it with a stopwatch. Um, you know, you can do a, a new guest I.O., I mean a new guest, and um, count the difference. And I was hoping that somebody had had a chance to try it in the hands-on lab, um, because that's what they were showing. And... Uh, Likewise, for this one, we take and we copy uh, regions of a disk based on a list of blocks that VMware has sent us from one spot to another on the same disk, or one spot to another in a different array even for storage vmotion. Or, I mean, I'm sorry, on, yes, yes. Uh, no, this doesn't work across the way. It, work, it will work across data stores, right? So across different LUNs for storage vMotion within a shared set of disks. So again, this is one that for cloning operations uh, and storage vMotion, you can just tell, it just goes faster. Now, this one, they showed it. It, it, was, it, was, it was quite a, a, a savings. It was like, you know, four minutes instead of, you know, 24 or something like that. It was a pretty big savings in, in this example. So these are the things, again, that your, your favorite array vendor and your VAI-enabled arrays, uh, it's all automatically on with vSphere 4.1. You can toggle it off. There are some, some, some switch settings in, within the uh, advanced parameter screens that you can put to zero, one, whether or not you do want to do any of these. So you don't have to reboot or anything. It's already happening. 
And if your array isn't VAI enabled, VMware figures it out and doesn't continue to bother the target with these SCSI commands that aren't going to do anything because the array isn't aware of how to handle this new mechanism. Uh, so a few vendors picking up on VAI, uh, you know, altogether goodness for storage, et cetera. So, I mean, hopefully that has shown that, gee whiz, I am getting better storage performance at the array due to these fast sublun operations, and I am getting better storage performance here from VAI without really having to do anything. So I encourage you to go ahead and chase these technologies when you get back if you hadn't and put them, because that's a longer term plan and you know, um, these, these presentations are available and there's plenty on, at least on VAI from the other vendors. And lastly, um, we're gonna talk about ease of use in terms of storage provisioning via something called storage pool management. Storage pool management is a feature of the various EMC plugins, and we have a few different flavors of it now. The CX plugin, for instance, does a particular type. It allocates storage from pools, um, but it, um, uh, uh, I don't want to say it's limited, it just does a specific thing. Uh, the NFS plugin goes ahead and does provisioning for that they're integrated with view desktops, etc. So EMC is really on to this thing. <clears throat> of provisioning storage within the quote-unquote native context of the vCenter administrator. And it's built on the premise that there exists a gap, a communication gap or a, an operational gap between the VM admin and the storage admin <clears throat> in at least a certain number of cases. If you're the, if, if, depending on your operation, if you're both a storage administrator and a VMware administrator, you know how many terabytes is free on your array, or you know, your vendor might not be able to give you a totally down-to-the-byte picture of it, but you know you're consuming your own storage. In, in larger organizations, there does exist a gap. I don't know what your experience is, but the whole point of this integrated storage stuff is, is to try to bring, that, bring those two sides together and at least talk the same language for starters. Now, for instance, VMware calls it disk hard disk one, and a storage vendor calls it, you know, some big long name, uh, and there may be a device ID associated with it, and it might have a friendly name, but those two things, there's really no way to put those two together, for starters. So this is a screenshot of the, what is now the EMC virtual storage integrator. Just the base, you know, it's a, 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 just the initial installation adds an EMC storage tab to the vCenter client, is anybody running any of the plugins from any vendor, any of the storage plugins from any vendor as a matter of course? One, two. Um, so that's about the proportion that we saw in Jay Judkowitz's session. He kind of had a birds of a feather yesterday where and we're really kind of wondering about this as a, as a whole, as a VMware community, I guess, because these are free downloads. In the case of Storage Viewer, it it decomposes you know, the relationship between a particular VM or a data store to hard disk two into all the details that you would need to know in a troubleshooting situation or it's not, it's not so much for allocation or you know, chargeback or anything like that, but it really it, it, it lays it all out there for you. And um, EMC's um, plugin supports Solera, VMAX, and Clarion. We are going to add support for the EMC VPlex in Q4. And it's a benign, if you want it to be, it's a benign viewer-only tool that adds this EMC storage tab. The, I think the closest other viewer, I mean, this is EMC, but the closest other viewer I saw, saw was the 3PAR plug-in. They, kind of, they aim to do a similar thing and, and decompose that relationship. The, uh, the, the NetApp one, although I'm sure there are new versions going to be coming out, <coughs> Doesn't really, they, they don't seem to aspire to, to provide that much detail. Uh, and their provisioning engine is just, you know, push the button and go. But there is some. There, you know, there's, have you used the NetApp plugin or? Oh, you did? Oh, good. Well, the, um, the demo, I go the demo from what I see on, uh, um, what you call it, uh, not Google, YouTube. It doesn't. The EMC storage viewer really peels it apart. If you compare the two, I mean, there are 24 different fields. And so the, the NetApp plugin, uh, the, um, 
what was it? It was RCU and then the other one that is now unified, and I guess there's another version of it that I heard is going to be like Storage Pool Manager, actually. Um, does a lot of other cool stuff, don't get me wrong. And so the point is, go to your plugins. Do your vendor plugin thing, whoever your favorite vendor is. Um, the, um, there's one from XIV I just saw, and again, they're, they're, they're you know, somewhat limited. So, <clears throat> so to get your plugin, this is going to bridge that gap, and it's based on that assumption. Okay, so storage pool management, what does this do? It's in context provisioning of storage, but what we find in the VMAX environment, uh, especially in any enterprise, is that we require a shared ownership model. You, the, the colloquialism or whatever is that we can't allow somebody to fall asleep with their finger on the button or having a brain cramp and chew up all the storage in a VMAX or a NetApp Array or a Calarian for that matter because they have a voracious appetite. And so storage pool management allows us to bound pools of storage together and create sort of a sandbox where that VMware admin can't really get themselves into that much trouble, for, for, you know, for lack of a better way to describe it. And so how does it play out? Well, we're going to be proactive. You're going to provision gobs of storage to the vCenter administrator. And also this is, uh, this is a little bit of a different paradigm here. The storage is given to the vCenter admin. I mean, to the vCenter instance, not to a particular person. So the storage at the storage array is tied to vCenter, and it's the vCenter GUID right now. So that's how it works. And I expect it to deploy VMs with agility, et cetera. But the, the point of this is it's a shared ownership model. And we found that to be critical uh, in, in, in our space. How does it work? Well, we got some familiar components on the right. vCenter, uh, vSphere client, uh, Symmetrics Management Console, if you're running a sim. Uh, this would be Navi otherwise. And Symmetrics VMAX. If you're running sim, and, and, uh, this is a VMAX thing. It's not a DMX thing. You would, um, uh, that's a, a, it would be a Clarion CX or whatever in, in the event of a Clarion environment. Uh, st uh, still, the, the, the actors are, are the same. The VMware admin runs through the vSphere client with this VSI plugin, but there's an additional line. If you're only doing the viewing, you just go right across the top. But if you want to play ball, with SMC, you take the line that kind of goes straight down there to the center and look at storage types, some familiar names there, performant, test. So you can see how if you tie this into fast policies now, you could give you know, the, that work you had done at the fast, fast policy setting, you could give that down to the VMware and vCenter instance and take advantage of all that stuff. The storage admin does have to set the table. We won't, we won't look at that table setting here. Um, I'll be honest, it's somewhat, I don't want to say cumbersome, but there's a few steps to it, and it was, it's the trade-off between security and ease of use, right? We'd like to, you know, we could have done it better with wizards and all of that stuff, and now we've gotten some feedback that said, why don't you, you know, do this in this order instead? Um, and, but, but, but it is easier to use. It's not rocket science. If you're, if you're doing Symmetrics Management Console now, if you're running VMAX now, or if you're running Navisphere now, it, this does make it easier. You do it from within that vCenter context. And there's the sim. So, uh, some sample operations. At the vCenter level, we provision storage into storage types, which are then subdivided into uh, among the clusters that are there in vCenter. And when you perform storage provisioning operations, like on the SPM cluster, you go ahead and you, you look at your menu. Now there's an EMC storage add data store to the cluster. You pick from those storage types. Now you don't have to do it, but this is when you follow the EMC menu. So you could still do it you know, the old way, as you're doing it in vCenter now. And again, we're we're betting that you know, making those operations easier and um, making the vCenter admin more aware of what's going on and how big the pie is is where we want to go in the future. And this has a lot of implications for ease of use, multi-tenancy. You, know, you do storage at one vCenter. 
Now you can do storage to another vCenter. You've logically split those entities apart and their owners. And then the, 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 uh, the vCenter user comes in and who's a- able to provision storage to begin with is the only one that can make all of this work as well. So we're tightly integrated with the way vCenter does stuff now. The VMware admin then can provision storage just like CPU and memory. You can go ahead and it's not necessarily shares and it's not storage DRS, but you are provisioning just like CPU and memory. Storage is becoming a lot more important now, right, to the the vCenter admin. Create and delete the data stores. The storage admin creates some thin pools. We know what thin pools are. Then we create the sandbox called the virtualization domain. That's the container. Then you set some policies that say, okay, um, how many LUNs overall, this is the fall asleep on the button thing, uh, not to allow somebody to, to overstep the bounds or part of it. Define some storage types, good, better, best, performance test, performant or test. They can be uh, in a non-fast environment. They can be geographic references, you know, upstairs, data center, whatever you pick according to storage tiers. We talked about what storage tiering is, a type of device and a RAID group. Okay, we have some of that granularity. We want to we want to not make you want to have to know the type in the RAID, the RAID type, um, but you just pick from good, better, best, what have you. And then lastly, the storage admin allocates this virtualization domain to vCenter instance, and that's where we get the gold, silver, bronze stuff. So we got some cool stuff coming up here. We have a demo. If you start from the bottom, the storage admin has already done the stuff I just spoke to you about. But during this demo, we will see the subdivision of that virtualization domain, further subdivision down to the resource pool level. You could argue whether or not you want to do that, but it is possible. And lastly, we're going to show the ability to add a raw device to an existing VM in the configuration. So this is about a three-minute demo. This is, that's going to conclude our presentation, and we'll have time for some some Q&A afterwards and some discussion. And I'll narrate as we go along, but we'll watch for the call-outs too. So watch this. <coughs> Here's the new storage tab that we looked at just by installing the VSI plugin, which you install it on your laptop, right? You install it on your client. There's the storage array that is currently mapped. So this is the viewer piece just telling us what's going on here. And ah, here's those storage types that we defined over there at the array. So this was the storage admin setting the table for us with performant test and archive storage types. There's a look at our vCenter instance. It includes something called the SPM cluster. And the SPM cluster has already had some allocations given to it, 200 gig, 250 gigs, et cetera. We are now going to subdivide down to the resource pool level in this particular resource pool. Oh, no, wait, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We're now allocating to the cluster itself. Let me see. No, sorry, I jumped ahead. We are allocating to the resource pool here. We're giving this thing so much of our archive uh, storage type and so much of our test storage type. So from within this GUI now, we're able to, and this is somewhat fast forward, but you're able to go ahead and mix and match and only allocate those particular types of storage to particular resource pools and tasks, and then effectively to the owners of those things as well. With that, you can see that the available storage is diminished, so we get the... uh, uh, the configuration is refreshed here. Okay, I'm starting to consume this stuff. So uh, the VMware administrator now knows what the heck is going on and what they have to deal with. And now we simply use the, we do the exercise of adding a 10 gigabyte RDM from a particular storage type. I think we're going to choose test here. And it's a wizard just like adding an RDM to a VM. Uh, but when you have the client installed, it gives you this option uh, through the, the EMC storage menu to go ahead and add the RDM from one of those storage types. So that's how it works. There is a, um, there's actually a tech book on uh, EMC PowerLink that explains how all of this works. There's there's, uh, some additional detail behind the scenes here. 
But that's it. That's it in a nutshell. And then we go back to the viewer. So here's the storage details from the viewer. You see, we show maybe 8, 10, 12 fields, including whether or not it's a thin device. And then we include power path, whether or not it's multi-path. <clears throat> There's the ability here, if this was a NAS device, to right-click on that thing and expose even further detail. So that last little bit was the ability to show off the viewer. And there you go. Lastly, you can see that uh, whoever performed that operation knows now that they just consumed 10 gigabytes of what was available to them. So I hope that was an effective demonstration of in-context storage management. Like I said, we have some other products out there that perform a similar thing. But the v VMAX implementation looks like that. We're going to tie that, again, to FastVP, because FastVP is a, that's coming. It's coming soon to VMAX. So this needs to be tied into FastVP. And you have to give people the ability to, um, you know, non-fast environments do the same thing according to the thin pools. So with that, I'll, uh, I guess I'll open up, uh, I'll, I'll ask for questions, but I'll open with a question. Do you see, so the basic premise of these tools is that kind of separation, right, of VMware, admin, storage admin, making those two people come together, bridging that gap. At least this, the premise of this is, in cases of some arrays, it's the same person. But do you see that, or is that just something that the vendors are chasing and it's not reality or, or what? Is there some, is, so you think there's some, some uh, division, I guess, between those responsibilities in your organizations? It seems so, yeah. And I mean, do you think then, uh, do you think then that tools like this, you might not like this particular implementation, but do you, do you think that tools like this are the way to go? Uh, and that, and, and I would presume then that, uh, you know, according to the title, you know, besides the vendor and who's giving it or whatever, that that would have been the hook I mean, I guess I was up against both Chad and, and Scott Drummond's, of all people, is having a performance session now. So when you read his improved performance abstract and this improved performance abstract, um, I can see where some folks that were interested in that would have gone over there. But so that's, that's the thing. So I guess among this group, and I guess among this group, we certainly find it compelling, um, it says, okay, this is, where we're, this is what we're after. So any questions or comments or? Sure. Uh, yes, indeed. If you don't set up the um, virtualization domains and you don't do anything at the array level to allow someone to provision, it, the functionality doesn't even show up. Yeah, you can make it a provisioning operation, but we offer the storage, what used to be called the EMC storage viewer, and now a flavor of VSI. That, uh, and so I'll give you another example of the viewing capabilities. With VSI, not only can you look at a particular LUN, but you can then, and whether or not it's multi-pathed, you can go ahead and right-click on that and from a central location see the, the details, the power path details. We have a power path guy in the back of the room there, Rob. Um, you can see those details. They, they, they worked with the VSI team to really expose that stuff. But that's all, if you want it to be, that's all read-only. So you should you know, go and, and you know, deploy this stuff for sure. Um, and so on that... I can tell you that um, depending on what you would deploy it on, would it be Clarion or Symmetrics or um, if it were a Symmetrics, let's say you were de deploying this on a Symmetrics, well, the management station of a Symmetrics includes something called Solutions Enabler and Solutions Enabler Server. We don't have a direct IP connection into a SIM like we do with a Clarion, right? So in that case, if, you're, if you want to uh, inspect that Symmetrics, you'll go ahead and go through your SE server somewhere. You know, you wouldn't, there's no IP address of the SIM that you would point it to. You go to the Solutions Enabler server. Um, however, if there's no SE server in the picture and you don't need one, VSI puts everything on your laptop that is required to go ahead and discover a Clarion, for instance, by its IP address. Or go ahead then, using that same exact laptop, give it the IP address of what is the the solutions enabler server, I hesitate to call it a management station, but because we have the element manager as well. But 
and just from your laptop, you have everything that you need. People sometimes get, include, they get confused. They say, well, does my laptop now need a SCSI? You know, if it would be saying to do the, do I need a SCSI connection between my laptop? No, no, you just need IP connectivity, and it's all, it installs right on that workstation. Uh, the storage provisioning feature or storage pool management uh, wasn't ported to DMX. But all the, the other stuff, the PowerPath stuff, the viewer stuff, everything. Um, oh, oh, no, oh, and overall for the presentation, okay, that's a good question. Same with VAAI. VAAI is not a DMX thing either. Uh, there's fast for DMX, if you can help me out, Rob, but I don't think there's going to be fast VP. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be the delineation. Fast VP, the one that we're looking at now is, and so here's the disclaimer or whatever, although it's been pre-announced and everything, is this is November time frame stuff for SIM. Except Storage Pool Manager is ready to go now, and Storage Viewer. The last piece is that was GA product. Um, and again, surprising of the storage people out there. Maybe it's because the... The audience of the plug-in advertisement is storage folks, right? And so the storage folks are more apt to know about them to begin with. Um, but does it, is it because, so now is there going to be some need to convince the vCenter admin that this is a good idea to put this plug-in in? Or, I mean, some people don't touch, don't obviously don't touch anything in their production environment without trying it out. We have some customers that have been months just with the viewer piece um, before they can, you know, Deutsche Bank or whatever can, you know, pin it as a production app. Um, I don't think they're actually the example, but somebody, it was somebody like that who I'm like, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're uncovering some details here to have that intelligent conversation. Good, good. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Uh, it's also important to look at the other side of the picture from the storage, right? If you take a look at the element managers, they should complement this. Here we take a look at a VM. And we, you know, in that example, we explore all these details. We explain all these details, paths, all its, you know, however many fields. Um, but there's nothing really, you know, you need to go to the element manager and say, okay, here's my storage array. Here are the storage groups that I know are assigned to VMware because they start with VMware dash something. Okay, fine. But I should be able to touch on that, and we don't have, at least in, in symmetrics, we don't have it today. The unified platform does. You should be able to touch on that storage and cross-reference back the other way. Here's all the VMs that are on that LUN, and as much, without establishing a communication back to vCenter, <clears throat> you should, uh, you could perhaps, I don't know how, you, how that actually gets affected, but you need to decode it in the other direction, right? So you would need to go back to vCenter to provide a, a good level of detail, and then you'd be using from there, you'd be using the VMware APIs to pull in that data into the context of the element manager. You should see all the storage vendors do that as well. I would bet that that's what folks are going to do. Oh, does it? Uh-huh. So good deal. If it makes your life easier. All right, folks, any other questions or comments? Well, have a good day. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I hope we uh, you know, got our point across and, uh, and uh, that you'll check some of this stuff out and uh, um, leverage it uh, moving forward. It's, uh, it's, all, it's all free. I mean, in the case of this, you just have to buy the VMAX, right? Or, and the fast licenses. Uh, but this stuff is all quote unquote free. Even the storage pool manager piece, all of that, right? The storage viewer, that's free power link downloads. Same, same with the NetApp the, uh, downloads, right? Yeah, it's all free. All the vendors get all free downloads now. So go ahead and take advantage of those. All right. Have a nice day, everyone.